and excited to be sharing with you this morning in our next uh, part of our series, Breakout. Um, and really, this series has two key focuses, and you'll see the subtitle there. It's about becoming all God has created us to be. We believe God has an amazing plan for each and every one of us, and He has called us into something amazing and wonderful and beautiful as He called us into His kingdom. And part of that series is for us to realize that, to start becoming what God has called us to be. But there's a second part, is that that involves us dealing with the things that are holding us back from becoming that. Dealing with those things in our lives that may be hindering us from breaking out um, into what God has called us to be. And that means we have to look at a very exciting topic over the next few weeks, and that's the topic of sin. <laughs> something we always love talking about. It's, it's the thing that holds us back from all God wants us to be and desires for us. And so we, we've decided to look at different stories throughout the scriptures of people who experience sin in their life and experience a moment or a, a series of moments of repentance, of coming to see this is not what God has for me, this is not what I am becoming, and so God is calling me to break free, to break out of this so that I can become everything he wants me. And we've been using this verse as one of our sort of framing verses, Hebrews 12, which says, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses, speaking of, of all the heroes of faith mentioned in chapter 11 before, surrounding us, let us then lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. I love that. So easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance, the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And, and there's this call there for us. Let us lay aside. Let us cast off some translations or say, let us put away these things that are holding us back. back. Let us break free, break out. There's this picture of a, of a runner who's hindered or ensnared and unable to run properly. Maybe their shoelaces, shoelaces are tied together. They can't quite make the steps they need to make. And they're unable to run unhindered or freely. It made me think, I don't know if you've seen these, these videos. They're actually quite heartbreaking. Uh, on, on YouTube or Facebook, you'll see these videos every now and again. They'll find an animal that's like been trapped in some kind of rope or string. It's really heartbreaking. It's, it's usually some animal that's got like caught up by someone's you know, rubbish and, and they've trapped. And, and then you get some good Samaritans. They're trying to free the animal. They're trying to cut it free. And, but it doesn't know what's going on. It's just in pain. This isn't right. And, it, and it's just trying to get away. And there's this sort of tussle. They've got to, sometimes it's a very dangerous animal, so they've got to really be careful. And they, they're trying to cut it free. And it's so afraid, it doesn't realize what's happening, and so it starts to lash out, and they've really got to work hard. But if, if that animal just knew what was, what was happening in the moment, there were people trying their hardest to release it from its bondage so that it could run freely, swim freely, experience all that was meant to. And I think sometimes that what, that's what it can be like for us. We, we get so caught up in something, we get wrapped up in our own brokenness, and God's wanting to cut us loose. He's wanting to, to let us free, help us to break out so that we can run unhindered, experience life unhindered. And sometimes we don't even realize that we are hindered, and yet we are. I know I've, I've shared this story before, um, but in high school, I, I shared an illustration the last time I preached about running, and people seem to think that means that I am now a runner. Okay, these were like long ago in a time far, far away. Um, so long ago when I was in high school, I, I did some cycle races and, uh, and we did, I think they had like the big one and then there was like a medium one, it was like 50 kilometers. And so me and my friends, we were like, cool, we're going to do this race. And, and I was definitely the slowest of my friends, so they just shot off ahead and like, like left me for, you know, in, the, in their dust. And I'm like cycling, I'm like, that's okay, I'm fine, I'm cool, I'm going. And then at one point, it hit this moment where I saw this young little girl, she must have been in primary school, and she's just like weaving in and out and I'm, I'm like just panting, I'm just sweat is pouring, and I'm, I'm like, okay, I know I'm unfit, but it can't be this bad, and she looks like she's mocking me, she's just sort of going in and out, and looks like she's on the, the most easy stride, I'm like, I can't believe this is so hard, I'd trained a little bit, I'd cycled before, why is this so difficult, and then some lovely soul came cycling past me and said, by the way, buddy, did you know your back tire is flat, and I was like, that would have been helpful to know 20 kilometers ago, eh? And uh, I'm really disappointed with all the people who cycled right past me and didn't tell me. 
But I didn't realize why I was hindered. I didn't realize why life felt like I was cycling with a flat tire because I was. And it took one person to point it out and say, you've got a flat. And then I could pull over it, change the tire. And it cycled a lot better after that. See, God uses the scriptures, his word, to show us where we may be hindered, where there is sin in our life so we can break out, repent, and run with freedom. I'm actually convinced that often, and not always, because life is hard. Jesus says in this life you have trouble. But I'm convinced that quite often the reason we feel like our life is like riding a bike with a flat tire is because we're not regularly in God's word, where he can nourish us and show us a better way, where he can point out the areas in our life that are like that flat tire, hindering us, holding us back. And so we keep pressing forward and we keep struggling because we don't know which tire to change. We don't know what to fix. And so today, we're going to look at the life of a character in the Old Testament, a character named King Josiah. You may have heard of him. He's one of the youngest king, the youngest king in the Old Testament. And we read about his life in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 34. So if you, if you want to start flipping there, you can, um, sort of after, after kings, if that helps. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to read. It's going to be a big chunk of reading today because we want to look at the whole narrative of his life and just bring out a few things. But just before we get there, I'm going to try my best to do a summary of just chapter 33, which, which looks at this. It's Josiah's heritage. And I think this is quite important as we look at his life because it really fills in some of the gaps for us. See, in chapter 33, we're introduced to two characters, Josiah's grandfather and his father. Okay, and in the book of Kings or Chronicles, okay, Chronicles is a retelling of some of the events that happened in the book of Kings. Okay, the book of Kings is a, is a telling of the history of Israel, the kings that came, and Chronicles is a theological look back. This is what God was doing. This is what was happening at that time. This is why God was doing it. And it sort of retells the story, but with a, a sort of looking back through God's eyes. And so we get to chapter 33, and, and, and what they do is every king is given a sort of label, they either did not do what was good in God's sight, or they did. They were either an evil king who led the nation into further evil and into idolatry, or they were an, a king that led them into, into worship and following God's ways. And what we see is Josiah's heritage isn't that great. I've got a note here, be brief, so I'm going to try and do that. Okay, <laughs> trying to honor you here. So his grandfather, King Manasseh, now he's sort of put at the pinnacle of the worst of the worst of the worst kings. He's the worst. He becomes king at 12 years old, and he reigns for 55 years. And it says he was an evil king. And in verse 6 it says, and I quote, he did a huge amount of evil in the Lord's sight, angering him. And it says that he caused Israel, caused the nation to stray from God. His sin was so bad and his leadership so corrupt that he actually caused the nation to, and I quote, do worse evil than the nations that the Lord had destroyed before. He was the one of the kings who instituted child sacrifice, mimicking the nations around that didn't follow God. Horrible things. And in verse 10, we actually see God reaches out. It says that God reaches out to him and the people, and this is what it says. It says they did, they did not listen to the Lord. And so he comes under judgment, and they go into a discipline, a moment of discipline. And in that moment, he actually does, near the end of his life, repent and start instituting change, but he's already sowed years and years of evil and idolatry. And then we have this short um, reading about his son, Amon. This is Josiah's father, and he becomes king after Manasseh. He's a king at 22 years old, and he only reigns two years. See, because despite his father's later repentance, he continues with the evil that his father did. He just continues the cycle. And in verse 23, we hear this. He did not humble himself before the Lord like his father. Instead, Amon increased his guilt. He knuckled down. He says, I'm not doing, I'm not turning, I'm going to continue in these evil ways. And he was so bad that his servants actually turned against him and they killed him. And the people then turned against them and they were like, you've done a despicable thing. And so they made Josiah king. And that's how Josiah at the young age of eight ends up on the throne. Because his father was so wicked that people turned against him, removed him from power and put his son in his place. That's the backdrop of this young king who comes into power, Josiah, eight years old, his grandfather considered the worst of the worst, okay, and his father killed for being just as bad. What a heritage. What a heritage. 
And so we come to our story, 2 Chronicles 34, and we're going to have a a sort of big chunk of reading right out the bat, and then we'll have a few paragraphs interspersed with just three points I want to highlight for us that can really lead us into knowing God's freedom from our own sin. 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And unlike his grandfather and his father, it says, he did what was right in the Lord's sight. And he walked in the ways of his ancestor David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. In the eighth year of his reign, so he's 16 years old now, while he was still a youth, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor David. And in the twelfth year, 20 years old, he began to cleanse Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherah poles, the carved images, and the cast images. Okay, and so this is, a, this is just a, a, introducing us to Josiah. He's gone the complete opposite direction. He's broken the cycle. He's like, I'm going to seek God. At 16, he's saying, I'm going to seek God. I'm going to seek the God of David, not like my grandfather, my father, who disobeyed God. I'm actually going to follow in God's ways. And at the age of 20, he starts to institute some changes in the nation. He starts to undo some of the evil that his grandfather and father had put in place. He starts to tear down places of idolatry, and we're going to read down the next few verses, just some of that, and, and I won't explain all of it. There's a lot, if you want, you can grab a study Bible or, or sort of look online at some uh, hopefully helpful sources and, and find a, a bit more about this. But essentially, he goes on an idolatry hunt through the land to find all these evil practices and to remove them. And so we read that in verse 4. In the presence, then in his presence, the altars of Baal were turn, torn down, and he chopped down the shrines that were above them. He shattered the Asherah poles, he, the carved images and the cast images, crushed them to dust, scattered them over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of, bones of the priests on their altars, so he cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. He did the same in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, and as far as Naphtali, and on their surrounding mountain shrines. He tore down the altars and he smashed the Asherah poles and he carved the images to powder. He chopped down all the shrines throughout the land of Israel to retu- and returned to Jerusalem. And you'll notice there's some repetition there. It's a way of them saying this was, this was a really extensive work. I mean, he had sought God as a, as a young person. He had seen that he needed to make some changes and he starts to work through the land and, and get rid of these idolatrous practices. And then in in verse 8, we see this. In the 18th year of his reign, he's now 26 years old, in order to cleanse the land and the temple, Josiah sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, along with the... Whoops, the days... That person, the governor of the city... (laughs) I did, I did read through this before, but I panicked over there. Uh, The governor of the city and the court historian, Joah, son of Joahaz. Okay? Could have removed some of these names. Um... (laughs) to repair the temple of the Lord. So he's been working on these reforms, and we get to this point in the story, and he sets his sights now on repairing the temple. The temple was in a bad state. And so now that he's removed some of the false places of worship from the nation, trying to cleanse the nation, trying to lead them in a better way, he now turns to the temple, and he's like, we need to repair the place of true worship. We need to bring some repairs. And so they go on this process. He goes... In verse 9, so they went to the high priest Hilkiah and gave him the silver brought into God's temple. The Levites and the doorkeepers had collected it from Manasseh Ephraim and from the entire remnant of Israel and from all Judah, Benjamin, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They gave it, the silver, to those doing the work, those who oversaw the Lord's temple. They gave it to the workmen who were working in the Lord's temple to repair and to restore the temple. They gave it to the carpenters and the builders and also used it to buy quarried stone and timbers for joining and making beams for the buildings that Judah's kings had destroyed. And so he's taken essentially just the collection of the offering that had been brought, tithing in those days, and he's brought that together and he said, yeah, use this to restore God's temple. Use this. Here's the funds. Here we go. We want to restore God's place of worship. And we read further in Verse 12, the men were doing the work with integrity. Their overseers were those people, the Levites and the Marites, Zechariah, Meshalim, and the Kohathites. Ah. Well, sure. The Levites were all skilled with musical instruments. They were also over the porters and were supervising all those doing the work task by task. Some of the Levites were secretaries, officers, and gatekeepers. Now we get to the key turning point, verse 14. When they brought out the silver that had been deposited in the Lord's temple, the priest Hilkiah found the book of the law of the Lord written by the hand of Moses. Consequently, Hilkiah told the court secretary Shaphan, I have found 
the book of the law in the Lord's temple. And he gave the book to Shaphan. This is the key turning point. They're busy repairing the temple. They're, they're doing what they need to do. He sent his advisors to go and make sure they have the funds necessary. And in the process of repairing the temple, they discover something. The law of uh, the book of the law. And this is most likely a scroll of Deuteronomy, what we now know as the book of Deuteronomy. It's most likely a, sc a scroll of the book of Deuteronomy. And so in verse 16, we see Shaphan took the book to the king. And he also reported, your servants are doing all that was placed into their hands. They have emptied out the silver that was found in the Lord's temple, and they have given it to the overseers and to those doing the work. Then the court secretary, Shaphan, told the king, the priest Hilkiah gave me a book. And Shaphan read it from the presence of the king. So here's his report. It's going well. They're doing what they need to do. They've got the money. They started. But also, by the way, did you realize we've actually found something? We wanted to let you know we found this book. And he starts reading it to the king. And now we take note of Josiah's response. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Then he commanded Hilkiah, Aachim, son of Shaphan, Abdon, son of Micah, and the court secretary, Shaphan, and the king's servants, Isaiah, go and inquire of the Lord for me. And for those remaining in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that was found, for great is the Lord's wrath that is poured out on us because our ancestors have not kept the word of the Lord in order to do everything written in this book. He hears the words of this book read out loud. They discover this law and they read it and it says he tears his clothes. This was, this was an expression in the Old Testament days of grief of lament, of distress. It was a moment where something is going and they would just tear their clothes. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where frustration or loss has been so overwhelming that you've just wanted to tear something. And he hears this revelation of God's law and he goes, something's not right. And he is shattered by what he hears and he recognizes that in himself and in the nation, things are out of line. They're out of joint with God's law. And so he sends them. He says, go to the prophet to find out what needs to happen. What is going to happen? What is God saying? And this actually brings me to my first observation. Repentance is for everyone. It's, it's so interesting. This is not a story of someone who's clearly despicable, right? This is not like one of those Paul stories. Someone's like attacking the church and he's amazing, comes to this amazing moment. He's like, yes, I've been such, so obviously an evil person and I'm turning away. I'm turning back to God because of all this evil I've done. No, Josiah at this point has been great. He's been amazing. He was seeking God at 16 years old, following God with all his heart. 20 years old, he's starting to execute changes. He's like leading, like godly leader. He's compared to David in some of those ways. And he's following God with all his heart. And yet he gets to a moment where he reads God's word and he goes, I'm in sin. I need to repent. Something's not right. He was a good king seeking God and yet He's in no way is he painted as a sinful leader, and yet it's the exact opposite. He breaks the cycle, and he turns to God. He's brought to repentance. He, he doesn't think, well, we're doing pretty good, so it should be okay. You know, he doesn't think to himself, you know, we've, we've done pretty well. Like we've, done, we've removed all of those idols. We've removed some of the things that have been bad. You know, we're doing so well in these areas. It should be okay. You know, or we've mostly done well in these parts, so this part really isn't important. Or, well, you know, this must be for those super bad people. This must be for those, this must be for my granddad and for my father who were really bad. He doesn't think that. He doesn't think that at all. He begins with himself, and he sees in himself something that is out of line with God's way. And then as a leader, he starts to think of the nation. See, I believe that the closer we get to God, the closer we draw near to God in relationship, the more we repent. There is a correlation between our nearness to God and the degree to which we are repenting. We repent more the more we know Jesus. It's just how it works. The closer you get to God, the more you want to repent. I was thinking about this. Um, we used to go on these road trips. We went to about three of them when I was in my 20s in Cape Town studying and they were awesome fun. We got up to a lot of mischief. And um, 
one of the things we'd do is we'd either ask the locals or Google online to see if there was a place we could go rock jumping or cliff jumping, okay, because that seemed like fun. And so we'd go and see if we could find, like, there'd usually be some outcropping somewhere, either in the sort of near the ocean or, like, a river somewhere or a lake, and you could, like, ask the locals, make sure it was safe, and you'd go there and you'd leap off the rocks into the water, and it was awesome, amazing. But I was always the same. It was always the same because I'm not actually that brave, really, when I think about it. And I would look and I'd go, I can do that. No problem. I'd look at it and I'd be like, oh, that's, that's not too bad. I can jump off that. And we'd all get excited. We'd get there. And some of my friends who are a bit more gung-ho, they'd get there and they'd just go for it. Bam, out. And the closer I got, the more trepidation started to fill my heart. The closer I got to this cliff and the closer I got to these rocks, like, this is a little bit higher than it looked like from back there. And then I'd get close. And then I'm on the edge and, you know, for all my shame, I'd just be shaking, knees clamming. My friends would be like, come on, Ryan. I'm like, wow, I've got to go now. I can't just, and sometimes I'd stand there for like five minutes straight, what felt like 30 minutes, just trying to draw the courage to jump. But my perspective had changed. You see, from far away, it didn't look that big. It didn't look that far. It didn't look that high. And the closer I got, my perspective changed, and I realized this is a lot higher once I'm standing on the edge. And I think it's kind of like that. Our perspective of ourselves and of life changes the closer we get to God. The closer we get to God, it's like a mountain in the distance versus standing at the, the, the bottom ready to summit and you go, I am so small. And the closer we stand to perfection, to the holiness of our Savior, the more we start to see, not the less, the more we start to see the things in our lives and they become so nuanced but just as serious. And we start to see the greed. We start to see the, 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 the issues in our hearts. We start to see the selfishness. We start to see the, the self-preservation, the lack of devotion. It's so interesting. I, 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 someone wrote an article on Paul and his progress, he, he obviously was against the church in the New Testament. He comes to radically believe in Jesus, and then he writes ha almost half of the New Testament. Most of the books in the New Testament are letters written by Paul. And he has three statements where he says things like, I am the worst of the apostles. Then he says, I am like the worst of, of Christians. And he says, I'm the chief of all sinners. Okay? If you look at those chronolog chronologically, the worst ones come later in his life, the more he's known God. The more he's known God, the more he's able to say, I am the worst of the worst. And it's, it's weird. It doesn't mean he's like so low on himself, like, oh, I'm just a terrible person, therefore I can't be happy or joyful. He's like bolstered by God's grace. And he's like, I am the chief of all sinners, but I'm coming to plant a church. I am the chief of all sinners, but imitate me as I imitate Jesus because I'm walking in repentance, trying to follow God as best as I can. You see, we can try to keep God at a distance, because we're trying to avoid seeing the sin that we actually know is there. And I think sometimes we do that with the scriptures. We avoid the Bible. We avoid those topics because we don't want to see them. We don't want God's light to shine on the areas in our lives that need to be sorted out. And we all need repentance, all of us. None of us are better. We all need repentance more than we think. More than we actually think. But we need to draw near to God and allow Him the opportunity, the privilege, the invitation to shine a light on the sin that is entangling us so that we can restore it and remove it. And so Josiah, in this moment, tears his, tears his clothes. In this moment of repentance, he says, go, please. He sends his committee or his, his buddies, his entourage. He says, go and inquire of the prophet. In the Old Testament, God would often have select people. The Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out, and so they would use prophets to speak to the nation. He, they were like mouthpieces. It wasn't so much about predicting the future, but speaking on God's behalf. And so he says, go to the prophetess. We need to know what God is saying to us. And so we read that in, in verse 22. So Hilkiah and those the king had designated went to the prophetess Huldah, the wife of Shalom, son of Tokath, son of Hesra, keeper of the wardrobe. It's an interesting title. It's like the fashion police. <laughs> she lived in Jerusalem in the second district. They spoke with her about this. She said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Say to the man who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I am about to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants, fulfilling all the curses written in the book 
that they read in the presence of the king of Judah. Just a side note here. If you read Deuteronomy, it has one of the most fascinating endings. It's, it's, it's an ending which says, pick one way or the other. Walk in covenant with God or don't. Blessing or disobedience. But then God uses, and, and the language can be a bit foreign to us today, but he uses the language of blessing and cursing, which is why in Galatians it says Jesus has become our curse. Because he says, if you choose to walk in covenant fellowship with me as a nation, you will experience blessing. That's how it would work in the Old Testament. But if you choose to disobey and to break the covenant and to follow after the idols of the nations, then there will be curse. And so what the prophetess is saying is God is going to keep his word. He's going to bring the judgment on these people for the nation's idolatry and sin. Look why, 25, because they've abandoned me and burned incense to other gods so as to anger me with all their works, all the works of their hands. My wrath will be poured out on this place and it will not be quenched. We struggle with that language, but God takes sin seriously, so seriously, Jesus had to die for it. It's not a light issue and we can try and be light and fluffy all the time, but it actually doesn't work. You end up with a very shallow version of faith. We need to deal with the things that entangle us and ensnare us and because God has anger towards sin. He has love towards us, but his wrath comes towards sin. And so she continues, Say this to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. As for the words that you heard, because your heart... So now she's saying, this is, this is what God says about Josiah. Interesting, there's a difference. So the the nation is going to be judged for their sin, having followed in the ways of Manasseh and Ammon. But now Josiah is getting a different word. And look what happens. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants. And because you humbled yourself before me and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I, God, myself have heard. I have heard I will gather you to your ancestors and you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I am bringing on this place and on its inhabitants. And they go back and report this to the king. He spared the judgment because of his tender and humble heart. Because this brings us to the second point. True repentance starts when we come to God with a tender heart. With a soft heart. A humble spirit. That means that we respond sincerely. And, and, and think back to what we said about Manasseh. God's word comes to him. And what happens? He doesn't listen. And he only repents when he's under the discipline and judgment of God. And Amon doesn't even repent at all. He's just so evil. just like, I'm not listening. I'm not interested. Heart of heart. No thank you. I don't care what God has to say. But, but Josiah, having been raised up in that atmosphere of brokenness, somehow, by the grace of God, is seeking God. And when he comes to the scriptures, his heart is soft. Jason used an illustration at the evening service a while back. He, um, he did it very practically. I'm just going to tell you about it. Um, but he brought out some clay for us to mold and said, yeah, you can make whatever you want. But he had tricked us. Okay? The, the clay had been baked and it was hard, and so we couldn't make anything. It just broke and crumbled because you can't do anything with hard clay. It's not moldable. It cannot be used other than maybe to hold a cup. But then he brought us some soft clay, and we could mold it and work it and make a shape, make something. And that's what it's like for us. If we come to God's word, we can come hard, and it will either break us or we just won't change. Our shape is stuck. Nothing changes. The shape stays as is. Or we can say, God, tender, soft before you. Yeah, like even if it's it's hard, even if it's difficult, you can shape me. What needs to change? See, when we come with the right posture to the Bible, with tender hearts and humility, God then leads us into genuine repentance. And and notice how Josiah is is said to have acted, how he has responded. It says that he, he sees his sin, but then also what's explicitly mentioned is his tearing of the clothes and his weeping. He feels it. He doesn't just see it and go, yeah, that's, that's objectively a bad thing to do. It's like, no, this has broken God's heart. This goes against his law, and this has grieved him, and so it's grieving me because I am in a space of brokenness. I am in sin. And he acts He sends, he says, go, we need to inquire of God. Go ask the prophetess. And now we're going to see what happens next. He actually starts to make changes. 
He recognizes the gravity of his sin before God and feels it deeply. He weeps and so he acts and he inquires and he starts to make changes. And it all begins with a soft heart towards God. This is why the author of Hebrews says, do not harden your hearts before God when he speaks. Do not harden your hearts before God when he speaks. And so we read, coming to an end, we've done well. So the king sent messages and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the Lord's temple with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, as well as the priests and the Levites, all the people from the oldest to the youngest. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. Public reading, verse 31. Then the king stood at his post and made a covenant in the Lord's presence to follow the Lord and to keep his commands, his decrees, and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul in order to carry out the words of the covenant written in this book. He had all those present in Jerusalem and Benjamin agree to it. So all the inhabitants of Jerusalem carried out the covenant of God, the God of their ancestors. And the chapter ends like this. So Josiah removed everything that was detestable from all the lands belonging to the Israelites. And he required all those present in Israel to serve the Lord their God. Throughout his reign, they did not turn aside from following the Lord, the God of their ancestors. And this brings me to my final point as we look at Josiah. Repentance is both renouncing and renewing. There is action, so we see it. Right, If we come to God with a tender heart, we read his word, what we see is that we will then see things in our lives that are out of sync, out of line, and need to be changed. And then that's a process of feeling it and acting on it. We renounce and we renew. At the heart of this, the word repentance has been so misunderstood. Most of us think it has something to do with, I know I thought this for years, it has something to do with saying sorry. And yes, there is a sense in which we need to feel remorse for our sin. That's part of it. But it's actually an action. Repentance is an action of doing a U-turn, of turning around, going one way, and then going the and now saying, I'm going to go the opposite way. And that's what Josiah does for himself and for the land. He removes all the evils, but he also renews the covenant. He restores the spiritual practices that were good for them to follow God with their whole heart. And their soul. It's not just saying sorry. I was thinking about how funny this would be. If imagine you were walking and you needed to go somewhere. I couldn't think of a specific thing, but just imagine generalization. You're walking in a direction, and you're like, I need to go somewhere, and someone who knows where you need to go says to you, By the way, you're going the wrong way, and you go, Oh, I'm sorry, and then you just keep walking that same way. I mean, that's just <laughs> so silly. And then someone else says, Oh, you're going the wrong way, I'm so sorry, and you keep walking the same way. Oh, you're going the wrong way. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna keep going that way. It's not how it's meant to work. And someone says, You're going the wrong way, you go, Oh, that's why I'm not getting where I need to go. I need to turn around and go the opposite direction towards life. Because we're all walking in the direction of death if we haven't repented before God, and He wants us to walk into life. Now, if we're not a Christian, we're walking right into death. Wide is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to life. And so we need to repent before God for the first time to receive Jesus and turn towards life. And then the road towards life is all about us making those minor adjustments. Okay, this is out of sync. I want to I walk in the most, the, the straightest way. I want to walk right in sync with God's will and his commands so I can experience the fullness of his life. God, when we read his scriptures and when we come to him, is showing us where our way is not aligned with his, and repentance is then us choosing to respond by reorienting, realigning, renouncing that which we need to turn away from. And so I want to encourage you, as God begins to raise things in you that need to be dealt with, they may be big, they may seem nuanced, but they're all serious. We must ask these questions. What needs to be removed? What needs to be renounced? And then what needs to be renewed or reinstated? What am I turning away from? What lie am I believing that's making me walk towards this temptation? And how can I turn away from that? And what am I turning toward? What life-giving thing does God want me to replace this with? See, Josiah removed the false idols of worship, of false worship, And he reinstates in chapter 35, don't worry, we're not going to read it. He goes on to reinstate the Passover, to reinstate the spiritual practices of devotion and renew the covenant. I want to just read quickly one verse out of James, well, a couple verses, one page, out of James 1, 
that I think brings this home to us. It's a warning for us. James says this. He says, Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And then he says this, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because anyone who is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror, for he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. This person will be blessed in what he does. And we are encouraged to look intently into God's word. That was what brought the change. That's what, that's what highlighted in this, this God-seeking king, Josiah, reads the law and he realizes there's, there's something that's out of line. He's been following God. He's not been doing any evil. But, he's, but then he reads the law and he goes, oh, wait, there's still something out of sync here. I still need to make an adjustment. And so we need to decide to, with soft hearts, read God's word, to, to marinate our lives in God's word, to read the scriptures, and to, as James says, look intently. And then to respond. Because when we don't respond, it's kind of like we, we've been doing James with the youth, and we were, we're talking about this, this, this metaphor that he uses about looking in a mirror. And we're like, it's kind of like if you look in a mirror, okay, and you're, you're about to go out or whatever, and, and you're like, cool, I need to make sure everything's okay. And you're like, oh, there's some broccoli in my teeth. And then you walk away, and you just forget to deal with it. And then you come back, and you look in the mirror, oh, there's some broccoli in my teeth. I should probably get, no, just, and you just, and you never actually deal with it. That's what it is like when we read God's word and we don't actually put it into practice. We see the issue and, and, and we don't deal with it. But when we, like Josiah, come with tender hearts before God, soft, I mean, that's the key to it, isn't it? That's where it starts. Tender hearts saying, God, I, like nothing's off limits. What do you want to highlight? What needs to be dealt with? Go to his word. And when he highlights things, we now see what is out of line. We feel, we go, God, what matters more to me than this thing that seems so precious to me at the time is actually your, your love and your relationship and walking in your ways. And so we feel that and we, 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 we weep over that. I'm not saying you have to weep over every single sin, but you know, there's a sense of gravity. And then we act, we do. We turn away and we turn towards God. And so I'm going to pray for us quickly, and then I'm going to invite the team up. We're going to go into a song, and after that, Jason's going to lead us in communion. And in this whole process, I encourage you, keep your heart soft before God this morning. Keep your heart soft before Him as He speaks. Let's pray. Your know, God, it can be so difficult for us when we have to come to these these. Um, weighty issues, the issue of sin in our lives. And it's weighty because all of us have sin in our lives. All of us need to be in repentance. The whole of Christian life, I think it was Spurgeon who said, is one of repentance. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that. And so God, won't you lead us? Your word says it is your kindness that leads us into repentance. And won't you in your kindness lead us, God? Would you soften our hearts? Would we be willing to come before you? And would you show us in our lives those areas that we, that we need to deal with that are entangling us? Show us where we have a flat tire. Show us where there's something that needs to be dealt with. Big or small, but always serious so that we can bring that before you, repent with sincerity, turn away and turn towards you and find life and freedom. Because that's what it's all about. It's not about us just feeling low and guilty and broken all the time. It's about us finding life and breaking out of all the patterns and the issues that are holding us back from experiencing the joy, life, and peace of the kingdom that you have for us. It's about becoming what you've called us to be and to become what we have been called to be. We need to break out of those things that are holding us back. And so to do that, we need to come to you, God, with tender hearts. So would you draw us by your spirit, draw us in with soft hearts to your word to see our sin, to feel it, and to respond in repentance. Help us, God, to do that. And would we bear fruit in keeping 
with repentance. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Won't you stand as we sing together?